Please stand for the word of our faith. A gospel this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 through 37. You have heard that it was said to the people of the world, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, You fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in the front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it said that it was said to people long ago, do not break your oath but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So far, text. Please be seated. <coughs> So Christian friends, you have heard, but I tell you, this is the key that goes back and forth constantly in our mid monthly service. Last week I showed a picture of Jiminy Cricket, and no one under 25 knew who it was. How many of you have ever heard of mid busters? All of you are picket. Worry here. Alright, well Jesus boss myths up all over the place. And he does this so that we can understand what forgiveness truly is. And it may sound like this is all God's law. God is just turning the thumb screws on you. And that's what he's doing. This sermon about is a clarification of God's law. In fact, I just have the first year of ministry. We all have a nice little curriculum and kids leave and they off. We've offered it to this school every year that I've been here. And this gentleman offered a great gospel-centered Sunday school program on the Sermon on the Mount. I said, I don't, I don't know that's really what we want. I didn't buy it because we already had one. But I said, I wonder if people really understand what gospel is versus law. The law shows you your sin, and the gospel shows you your Savior. That's the difference. It's very, very basic. We're going to get this about study next week in our Back to the Basics. Bible study. We, of course, have a congregation meeting today, so we won't have an opportunity to jump into that. But let's jump into some of these myths. I want to take you first to verse 21. The overarching myth that I want you to see here that Jesus is going to dispel is you need to be good enough for God. That was this guy in the phone book. You need to be good enough for God. This is a myth, by the way. But you need to be good enough for God. So we're going to bust that one at a time and start to kick some legs off of this chair so it falls to the ground. And the first one is verse 21. The word that was said to the people on the road, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Well, I'm doing really well on the topic of 
murder. In fact, you know who that guy is? That is Francesco Cali. He was the mob boss of the Gambino crime family. I'm going to make this up. This is true. There's all kinds of mob bosses. The Godfather is based on real life mob bosses. This is kind of scary, actually. This happens. Well, this guy was uh, living outside of his home in Staten Island, New York, back in October 2019. And just happened that there was another mob boss who was acquitted in court that exact same day. This never even cycle of crime and murder keeps on going on. So you might be thinking, what about my boss? This guy thought he was responsible for the death of hundreds of people, but nobody could ever pin the murder on him. Well, I'm thankful as I've gotten to know you, none of you were able to organize crime. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> but, but, this is his boss. Just because you haven't killed anybody, Jesus says in verse 22, but I tell you, anyone who's angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Racha, and you can read your footnote at the bottom, an Aramaic turbo contempt, maybe idiot, I guess, I suppose, is answerable to the Senate, but anyone who says you fool will be the angel of the fires of hell. And my all my friends got really helpful when I would tell Philip Martin, you're a fool. They didn't like that. Because they read the story of the Bible. And in general, it's not good to insult people, including their brothers. And if you want more proof, in 1 John, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that murderer is eternal life. God even guards your thoughts. And that's going to be a theme through this whole sermon. Now, I've never been a mob boss or responsible for anyone's death. But I may be responsible for things that make people angry. I get angry at my kids. Once in a while I get angry at my wife. I think I may have even gotten angry at some of you sometimes. And I need to be careful because when God gets angry, He does it perfectly. When I get angry, I do something dumb. That's the problem. So, that's the first, first myth busted. There's more to it than just murder. Let's go on to the next one. This is verse 27. You heard it was said, do not commit adultery. And you're like, well, I've never cheated on my wife or spouse or had sex outside of marriage. And this is more and more common today. This cute couple, this is Bridget and Alice. They made the New York Times last week because they are in a poly... polymorous? Polyamorous? Polyamorous. Polyamorous relationship. Thank you. A polyamorous relationship... For those of you who do not know, if you're, I don't want to say too old, because that's not But if you've never had a polyamorous relationship, this is an open relationship. Bridget and Alex agreed very early in their marriage that they would be seeing other people because they thought this was a good idea. Now, I can give multiple first hand accounts of people that I've met who have tried this great idea called an open marriage, and it ends in tears. It does. Everyone that I, I have yet to meet someone who's been in an open relationship, except for Bridget and Alice, who like it. And if you like some primary source information, I can introduce you to them. And they'll tell you straight up this is a bad idea. God's plan for marriage is glorious. I dare say it's perfect. His plan is. Marriage is hard, obviously, because there's two sinners involved. So. You might say, well, I'm not like Bridget and Alex. My marriage isn't open. And my God would say, well, it's not that simple. Verse 28. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And here we're talking just your thoughts as you walk down the street. Whether you don't have to go dive into porn sites on the internet, you can just watch a movie. Turn on Netflix. And watching a series that was benign last week and this week, it's not. It's difficult to beat those thoughts away. And we pile on top of this, and you get into the topic of divorce. It said anybody who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. That was done so because their hearts were hard. This is just the legal requirements of God's Old Testament people. God says, I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress. Anyone who marries the divorce woman commits adultery. The point is, God doesn't want divorce. Marriage is 
designed to be permanent. And there are exceptions to this as Jesus talks about how a marriage can break. But in general, he doesn't want people to divorce. Now people have said, Pastor, did you hear that the divorce rate is going down in America? And I would say, yeah, that's because people aren't getting married. It's not because people are having less sex outside of marriage. That's disappointing. <coughs> Let's keep going. Uh, we have one last one. This is on the topic of oath. Oh, three, three, three. Again, you have heard it that it was said to people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. That is a quote from Leviticus. And I think all of us, if we were in a court of law, would make an oath, and we would keep it. Because if you're under oath, that makes it happen if you lie under oath. And that's what your God wants you to do. Jesus was under oath, and he said, I charge you under oath, are you the Christ? And Jesus said, it is as you said. There is nothing wrong with doing this to serve our government. That's what it asks us to do. But, okay, great, you never lie in court. What does Jesus say? But I tell you, do not swear at all. You don't need to swear on your old trophy. You don't need to swear on your mother's grave. I mean, Jesus lives his own life. These are, I mean, if people think that you're lying just because your lips are rude, there's a problem. Be trustworthy. And let your yes be yes. And your no, no. Now, when you can walk away from all, and the grand myth that we are trying to bust is you need to be good enough for God. And you can. We're going to get to that a little bit deeper in a second, but just understand that Jesus is not the great law giver. People that read this chunk of Matthew and walk away from Jesus and go, wow, he's amazing. He's just like Moses. Really? He's God. He's not just like Moses. He clarified God's law for us. But understand that he didn't just give it to you so you'd have a better option to how to keep it for you. He knew that you couldn't. Jesus is not the great law giver. He's the great law keeper. He never hit anyone, even though people tried to kill him. And he knew it on a daily basis. He never lost it after a woman, even though he was a blue-blooded male. Just like every other male on the planet. He upheld marriage. And he kept his word. He still does today for you. Every promise that Jesus made, he'll keep for you. Jesus kept God's law perfectly for one reason. That was so that he could be the great sacrifice for sin. So let's go through this grand one. You need to be good enough for God. I've already tipped my hat that you can't. And so this goes to the next one. Prison. Verse 25. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you are still in the way and while you may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. This is true in Jesus' day, and it's true today, too. If you get yourself in trouble, you're going you're gonna to go to jail. I, I joke with the kids at the, at the school or any of them that I coach soccer. Listen. Either you obey your parents or you're going to obey the state. Someone will get you in line. Society just doesn't stand for it. And, so spiritually speaking, how long can you break God's law? Can you just keep on breaking God's law and no one will know and everyone will know it? Well, this was confirmed. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, you will not get out. Until you see the last penny. That God does not mess around. Hell is real. And no one talks about hell more than Jesus. Jesus and they think it's the same. That's the unhappy truth that people try to ignore when you look at Jesus' whole body of work. Oh he was God. very serious. And he was so serious about it that he went to the cross. And he went to that third oh, sacrifice oh, for our sin. So what does that mean for us? A real Jesus? Does that mean that you can look at a red law and you can stop? Not, be, not just because you're worried about getting into a car accident, but because, you know, I can serve my God in this way. You can look at all of God's laws. 
and see that and say, this is how my God wants me to live. This is how I can say thank you to Him for all that He's done for me. God's law takes on a completely different meaning for you. It's not a club hanging over your head. It's a road map to how you can make the perfect finger painting for your God. It's beautiful. I was in Virginia Beach yesterday doing a school of outreach for two churches, Resurrection in Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, and I'll be the girl. And it was a lot of fun to work with this church. They had a preschool that was two years old, and it was doing great. It was full, they had kids, they had artwork, but the artwork was tucked away back on the back fellowship wall. You would have had to have walked past everything in our church and another building yet to find the artwork. And I said, wait, do it. Put that front and center. So when people walk in, this is your identity in your church. So this is what we were working on. I said, you want that to be your identity? You are with the little kids. They're, they're a high school teacher made a blog on their website. And their website ranks at score because I'm sure parents want to see their artwork every send it to the grandparents all of it. Your God wants to see the bigger paintings that you made for your for him. They don't look like bigger paintings, they look like you being married. They look like you stopping for life. They look like you being a man or woman of your word. They look like you keeping your anger in check. Those are all ways that you say thank you to your God. And it's beautiful. Dear friends, you've heard it said, but I tell you, these are all myths that Jesus busts for us. Because he wants perfect obedience. He says, be perfect, because I don't know if you're not perfect. He does this not to cripple you, but to remind you how desperately we need him. Now, the only place that we can be saved is in his, in his almighty arms, and that is where we find true peace. True peace in Jesus. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding